Daniel, let's imagine the situation. You are at, in a party, in a bar, meet somebody that is new for you, and this person asks you, Daniel, what is your work? What are you doing? I'm thinking about the future. And uh, I think about the future in terms of a physicist, because a physicist's training is actually to think about things which do not exist yet or which we have not understood yet. And these are all questions which are open and we are very curious. We are interested uh, in uh, developing new ideas. We love new ideas and uh, we try to understand how nature works. We try to uh, explain phenomena which uh, have been observed by colleagues in their labs. I'm a theorist, I should say. And my work is basically thinking. And I think about that can happen and what we can do in the future. But uh, it's quite different uh, to someone uh, like a philosopher. Uh, we try to think about the future based on uh, the knowledge which we have on science. This is physics. It's based on mathematical formulas. And we try to uh, extract from model building how we can develop uh, new ideas, concepts. Uh, maybe, hopefully, in the end, they even can turn into new technologies. So this is uh, basically uh, what drives me, what I find important, uh, you know, as a part of a society to contribute. I, f I thought first you stop with your uh, answer after, I think about the future. And this is a really nice answer because this provokes interest in, 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 in your uh, um, partner. And then I thought, oh, this man is philosopher or is he perhaps futurist? <laughs> and, and you know that in quantum physics, there is sometimes a part of philosophy in it and people mix that sometimes up. Are you aware of this? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, it's actually part of uh, our daily work uh, because we have to uh, also develop uh, pictures and intuition uh, about the formalism. And uh, almost everyone has his own kind of intuition and picture. So it depends also a little bit in which part of physics you work. I mean, physics can be divided roughly into three levels. So there's the you know, high energy type of physics, uh, CERN uh, physics. Uh, there is uh, astrophysics, cosmology. And then there is the big part of physics, which uh, is called solid state or condensed matter physics these days. And in that field, people think about uh, how nature, which we see it, you know, with our eyes, basically, uh, how does it work? And uh, it's also uh, extremely challenging because uh, we always have to find models of nature because it's not just, uh, you know, we have formulas we can describe. We need to uh, kind of boil it down. We have to cook it down and we have to make simple models as simple as possible, but not simpler, and then uh, apply it to the machinery the formalism, quantum physics, and uh, see if we can uh, understand how things work when we have many, many uh, constituents, particles uh, interacting with each other, for example, and then uh, try to make predictions. And those predictions, uh, we would like then the experimentalist to test in the lab. And only when those tests are positive and confirmative, then we are happy. Only. And, and, and if the experimentalist cannot prove what you have um, calculated before, what, what, is then, what is then happening or what is going wrong? Well, I mean, there are two attitudes. If you are an extreme theorist, then you just say, too bad for nature. Too bad for nature. <laughs> because the theory is <laughs> nice. Or bad experiment. Would <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I assume that my colleague is doing the best possible. But yeah. sometimes uh, it really turns out that uh, we do not necessarily, uh, you know, commit mistakes, but we make simplifications which do not correspond to what nature uh, describes. So uh, the creative part, the, uh, the most creative part of our work is actually to uh, conceive of models. And uh, that uh, means one has to kind of think what is important and what is not important. And then we leave out things in the description. And then we are not always 100% sure that this assumption leaving out something was actually correct. And this can uh, you know, haunt you then in the end when you make a prediction and nature says, no, that's not uh, how we work here. And perhaps you left out something that is important. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And this is exactly you know, the issue also with the field of quantum computing. Yeah. 
But you said we want to we want to uh, develop simple explanations, simple models, and now you're going to quantum computing. I don't think it is simple. <laughs> uh, we heard a lot of lot of um, very interesting talks. I understood a little bit the the superposition of of uh, of quantum physics that uh, something can have. N n two states at once and perhaps I understood this but uh, with the entanglement uh, my 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 ability of, of imaging these things it's too much for me and you keep it simple and explain me please once again what is entanglement okay good I mean uh, you know simple and simple might mean different things <laughs> <laughs> for the physicists <laughs> and the lay. So what we mean by simple, I say this first and then I answer your question. So what we mean by simple is essentially that we can use textbook knowledge. And uh, this is something we are supposed to know, right? And uh, if we can cook it down to something like, uh, uh, you know, to where we can apply our textbook formalism, then we say it's kind of simple. But uh, very quickly, uh, it becomes so complex and complicated that uh, it's outside uh, our present knowledge, our present mathematical power and techniques to solve problems. Then it becomes complex. So everything uh, which we know, for example, about quantum computing, the ideas uh, which we are following when you say now superposition of zero and one, this is simple for us. And uh, entanglement is also a concept which is simple for us in principle. I mean, this is how we are trained. So we train our students, uh, we explain that to them. So now if I have to explain this uh, to, and I will explain them maybe later why it is simple and uh, in reality it's much, much more complex. So simple in, in uh, entanglement still, you know, for an outsider, for a non-expert, of course, is very, you know, mystical. I mean, it's, uh, it's very, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's not something which we experience in our daily uh, life and it's the same for me. So I cannot say that I really see what entanglement is. I just have learned that there is a correlation, as we call it. Correlation means I have two parties. Let's say, you know, a spin up and a spin down. And uh, if I uh, have them together, they can look up and down. This is classical. And now imagine uh, I put that into a box, I put that into a box, and then I shuffle these boxes around, but I keep them always in the same direction so that you do not know whether in this box it's up or in that box, but still, you know, they, they are correlated. So if I separate them now and I open this box and you see that the error is up, then you know immediately that the other error is down. This is a classical correlation. This we can understand. Now, quantum mechanically becomes now more complicated. There we prepare the box like this, up and down, plus the opposite, down and up. And then we separate. And then we do not look in this direction, we look in this direction when we measure. And we still see then some correlations because the original state was entangled. If the original state would not be in a superposition of up, down, plus down, up, then we would not get these correlations. And so this is now uh, basically a correlation which is maintained no matter how far we uh, separate the two particles in space. And this has to do with the fact that this entanglement is not in our physical space. It's in the space of, let's say, of a spin. And this is a extra space. And this extra space doesn't care whether you separate the two particles from each other. In this space, they are still entangled. And now we just look now at this particle at one end of the universe, and then we know how the other particle uh, must behave if they are entangled. If they are not entangled, they behave differently. And this is uh, what uh, Einstein, you know, termed so nicely, spooky action at the distance, uh, basically meaning that uh, how can that be? You know, we are so used to the notion in daily life that everything is local. If this is at one end of the universe, or let's say here in Switzerland, and the other one is somewhere in, uh, you know, in, in uh, Sweden, why would they have any correlations to each other? This is not, uh, you know, common sense. And uh, for Einstein, uh, this was basically a uh, mystery, and it was also, uh, he was thinking, the theory must be incomplete. We just don't know it, and we have a theory which assumes that there is such a correlation over a long distance, non-local. And so this led then uh, to a lot of thinking, 
more from a philosophical side. Actually, many physicists didn't care about it because the formalism was proven in so many cases. They said, oh, so what? I mean, we know it's, it predicts it. It has to be like this. But still, if you want to understand it more, then uh, there were theories developed by Bell, basically saying, OK, what happens if I have a local theory like Einstein envisioned? Uh, could I still then describe the outcome, which is predicted by quantum mechanics? And the answer was no. You would run into a contradiction. So a local theory which has hidden variables, which we cannot see, but still would act uh, over long this, that's not possible. And so we learned then basically quantum mechanics is just, you know, it's just true. And we have to come to terms with our understanding that we somehow need to have a picture for this, which we cannot really have because we do not experience this in real life. So when I say I understand entanglement, then basically I just uh, express that uh, I know how the formalism works. And I know that there are correlations once I have all this uh, quantum mechanical uh, behavior. But I cannot, uh, you know, I never have a feeling of uh, uh, heureka that uh, I, I, I just got used to it. So you, so you got pictures, you can describe it, you understand the formula. and But understanding in a deeper sense, you accept it. Yes, because it's also the question, what does it mean to understand in a deeper sense? And then uh, quantum mechanics says, there is no deeper sense. It's just in your classical brain that you think there should be a deeper understanding. So in quantum mechanics, there are actually questions uh, which are called meaningless. I should not ask this question because there is no answer to it. <laughs> this is difficult for a scientist. Scientists are used to ask yeah, questions. Yeah. And, and there we, we touch the, the, the field of, of uh, philosophy. We also, it, it is mysticism a little bit. And yes, it is. It is totally. I mean, you know, if I would not have my mathematical formalism and I would speak the way I do about entanglement, then it's one to one to mysticism. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no distinction. And I think uh, this is the, the, uh, probably the big misunderstanding when someone who does not have this mathematical understanding talks about it and, uh, you know, goes free space. Yeah. I always can control myself in the statements which I make, controlling in the sense that I have to be sure that they are mathematically obeying the formalism. So I, I also have to be cautious. You know, sometimes I would then say, oh, yeah, it's like this. And then I need to go and check. I calculate and say, oh, no, actually not. Yeah. This assumption was not quite correct. And this happens to us. This happens to the best people in the field that they sometimes make uh, unconscious assumptions in their thinking, which is not allowed by quantum mechanics. And then after a string of very logical uh, thoughts, they can be perfect. At the end, they come to a conclusion which is in contradiction to quantum mechanics. And then you have to go back and really check very carefully where you made a hidden assumption which is not consistent with quantum mechanics. So how do you then feel if you hear a lays um making quantum mechanics as an instrument of their uh, argumentation. I spoke to, to uh, homeopaths, I spoke to uh, esotericism uh, uh, people, I spoke to people who, who think that teleportation is possible, um, not in the meaning of one entangled um, uh, object and the other. And they say, well, you see, in quantum mechanics, there are things that cannot be really understood. And this proves that in homeopathy, there is a quantum effect. We only cannot explain it, but there is this quantum effect. How do you feel about this, um, this attitude of people who are not in the field, but talk about or, or use it as an instrument? Yeah, okay. I mean, you know, there are two reactions one can have to it. I think it's, uh, I think the first reaction should be, it's great. The people think, you know, that they can take something away from physics and from quantum mechanics, uh, which fascinates them and uh, they get interest, uh, I would say, in this field. You know, quantum mechanics and physics is uh, part of our culture. You know, we talk about, when we talk about culture, usually about uh, history, language, art, uh, music, and so forth. We rarely talk about what science actually is. Science is also part of our culture. You know, I'm not talking about uh, on my own. I mean, I'm talking on the shoulders of giants, so to speak, which developed, uh, you know, over a century, uh, this kind of language. And within that uh, culture, I would say, everyone should be welcome to find this interesting. You know, when I go to a concert, I also find it extremely interesting 
interesting and I have my thoughts. I could never write what uh, Beethoven or Mozart did and still I can... Perhaps you think it sounds good to my ears, but you cannot explain no. why it sounds good. Yeah. And I could not really do it. <clears throat> and I would never uh, say, you know, that ah, what is in the music, you know, is maybe in some other part of my life and explains it. And now if you go to the next level and people are very serious and say, well, you know, I think uh, homeopathy, you know, is, uh, is, is very reasonable because uh, I have this analogy which you just mentioned before that I would say you are on very thin ice if you say that on very thin ice because you know <laughs> there's a very running joke uh, we have among physicists if you believe in the homeopathy then uh, you should never buy any medication you just walk in front of a drugstore It's about the same dilution <laughs> yes. of all medication, yeah, okay. you know, which is inside the uh, drugstore you have also outside. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> is, well, you know, is, uh, something, uh, you know, diffuses out. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's so uh, diluted that you could say, well, okay. Yeah. Now, uh, if people still claim it, fine. But uh, as a scientist, I have then the uh, kind of the expectation if someone wants to maintain that claim, he has to give evidence, as we call this in our field, right? I mean, we have many colleagues, they claim this and they claim that. We are very skeptical. So even if they claim this within the physics uh, 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 context, you still ask them, prove it. Of course. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, especially in our field, uh, we have to, as I explained before, we have to uh, create models. Then I make assumptions. And this is actually the source of many fights which we have in the field, that someone says, I get this and I get that prediction. And they're different. I use the exact quantum mechanics and the other guy says, I use the same quantum mechanics. Then you have to figure out why do they not get the same prediction? Why do they get different results? And who has the, best, the better arguments? Exactly. And then you come back and you have to look at the model assumptions which uh, each of them made. And then you start to realize they made slightly different assumptions in the beginning. And that can lead them to different uh, predictions. But still, there is something they have to prove. So they tell me then uh, where they start and uh, use then, uh, you know, the tools of the trade and they come to a conclusion. And I, uh, if this is not my theory, I try to follow. And I try to see, is it convincing at every logical step? So let's assume, you know, there's no technical error. Most of the work can actually have technical errors and then it's out anyway. But there could be good work where actually just the assumption was slightly off. And so uh, if someone comes now and says homeopathy, you know, is, uh, is like physics, we just haven't found the theory, then this is as, you know, to me, it means nothing. Okay. And you know, but you're not angry with no, those people? No, no, no. I mean... Look, people can believe in God. I mean, it's fine with me. <laughs> okay. People can believe in God. Um, is it possible as a physicist to believe in God? I would say it's not excluded. I mean, if people make that choice, uh, you know, then uh, it's a little bit of a dichotomy, I think. As a scientist, uh, you're used to not believe. You start from facts uh, and... Uh, try to see, you know, if these facts have actually some evidence in reality. And if reality is that what we can perceive, perceive uh, with our senses, then uh, there is kind of a discrepancy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you have to make a decision, you know, if you can live with that discrepancy and you can say, okay, it's totally outside of my uh, uh, human capacity to even understand it, but I choose to uh, believe in it, then, uh, well, please do it. Although you're not an astrophysicist, allow me to dig a little deeper in, in that God question. I mean, phys astrophysicists can explain the Big Bang and the, 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 the origin of the universe and all the dust of the stars and everything and the expansion and contraction of the universe and so on. But what initiated the Big Bang and what was before the Big Bang? And there is, perhaps it is close to come then to something like God. Yeah. Because the astrophysicists yes. cannot explain yeah. it either. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, it's a little bit a question. Uh, the answer you want to give to it uh, depends on you, what satisfies you, right? It's a question no one can give you an answer. Do you I need, some, do you you need an something in your, in your view of the world before the Big Bang? Or is no. it... No, I mean... Does it bo doesn't it bother you? No, actually, before? you know, this is very similar to me, like quantum mechanics. Yeah. Uh, I don't really picture, understand, you know, how quantum physics works. 
with my classical understanding. So I know already that there is actually something for me which is outside of my kind of natural perception. So should I get now hyped up if, uh, you know, in other questions of life, uh, this is also the case. But this is not a proof. I'm just saying, you know, for me, it's more kind of, uh, yeah, it's natural uh, that such questions can occur to which we do not have answers. Now, if you are unhappy, if you don't have an answer to such questions, and then you can replace it by a seeming answer, and you choose whatever uh, okay. makes you happy. Okay, let, let's go back to, to quantum computer. Do you think that the quantum computer will change our everyday, because the quantum effects are not in the everyday's life, it's, it's, it's so to say in another world, but do you think that the quantum computer does change our everyday's life? Okay, I mean, I would say, uh, let me just maybe slightly correct you. Quantum mechanics is actually in our everyday's life. For example, this light, this consists of photons. They go in your eye and they go in packages. Packages are quantum packages. And, uh, you know, it's a quantum mechanism in the end. Uh, the camera which we have here, you know, consists of circuits which are based on quantum. And the photovoltaics that I just installed on my roof is quantum mechanics. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So in this sense, you know, we are surrounded by uh, the effects of quantum mechanics. Now, quantum computing goes a step further. So there is a feature of quantum mechanics which is uh, hardly visible in all these uh, devices uh, and, and not used. And this is what we call entanglement. So this is a spooky action uh, at a distance. And this entanglement for a very long time was considered to be just a kind of philosophical part of quantum mechanics, but not of great use. And 25 years ago, people started to ask the question, can we make use of it? And this is basically the beginning of quantum computing because uh, uh, one started then to realize uh, it's not only the single particle properties which can be quantum, it's also the many particle properties which uh, the, uh, the, the quantumness, which is very important. And so uh, at that level, uh, there's then a feature of, uh, of uh, uh, quantum mechanics, which is very important. And this is what we call coherence so that uh, systems can stay in superpositions, as we say, right? I mean, uh, this How long picture. they maintain this uh, How long status. they maintain. And you see, the simple thing is, uh, we just write that down, uh, superposition of up, down, plus down, up. Very easy for me to write down. So this is what I mean as simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, from this simple concept, you can work out, uh, you know, quantum computing and stuff like this. However, uh, this picture is only valid in absolute empty space and only these two particles. But we know as physicists that this is actually not a good approximation. This is now, you know, here we come to the model. Is this model good? And in, 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 to begin with, yes, it's good so that we can see what we can do. But then we have to ask ourselves, how good is it actually in reality? And nothing in reality which we can uh, see or can use is isolated. And this is very, very important. So we are always uh, surrounded by other things which interact with us. And this interaction, we call this environment, we call this noise, uh, acts on uh, coherence and destroys it. And it destroys it, it destroys it very, very quickly. This is the problem. So uh, there's this beautiful uh, property, but uh, nature doesn't really want to maintain it. <laughs> and uh, what we try to find now is, you know, to kind of squeeze nature into a direction that it can be maintained. And that's the uh, ultimate idea of a quantum computer. The quantum computer uh, is so demanding because it has to fight the noise all the time. So it's actually really, you know, it, the, the, the overhead and all the power which goes in building a quantum computer is the fight against the noise. And that makes it very, very complex because uh, there are, you know, zillions, millions and billions of particles interacting with my system. And I don't want that and I try to isolate it. But I cannot isolate it too much because then I cannot test it, I cannot look at it. You know, that the fact that I look at you, that I see you, is only possible because uh, there's light which interacts with you, scatters from you to me, and then I see you. If there would be zero interaction of you with your surrounding, we would not see you, we would not hear you. And so uh, this interaction also does constant, as we call it, and constant measurements of your uh, being. 
And measurements in quantum mechanics always means it uh, suppresses and destroys uh, the coherence. And this is what we are trying uh, to kind of circumvent and uh, find an optimal way. So there are different speak. techniques to do it. Uh, some some uh, groups try to use the spin, some tries to try to use the superconductivity, some, some work with uh, trapped ions, with ion chains, now with molecules. And even the, the, the method to manipulate these systems are very... Uh, Uh, different. So th somebody uses laser light, somebody uses electro electronic electric fields, others use magnetic fields. Do you think that the quantum computer someday will uh, exist with one method or will this diversity of methods be maintained? I think that's a brilliant question. Uh, and it, it's actually a very good question in several sense. Uh, you know, in, 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 to some extent, there is a beauty contest. <laughs> a beauty contest. Yeah. So basically, you could say uh, we have started, uh, you know, as a picture, we have started a race. And we want to have a race from here to the moon. What do you build for this? And, uh, you know, we don't really know uh, what is the best vehicle, let's say. And some, uh, you know, they, they uh, tune their Ferrari and their Maserati and make it faster and whatever, right? And uh, some uh, have other means. In the end, what you really need is a rocket. Mm. And at the moment, we don't know which vehicle is actually the best one to achieve uh, the goal. And so now there are many uh, vehicles, uh, you know, racing, mm. but we don't really know, you know, are they going actually to the final goal, which we would like to have. So in the beginning, they all say, yeah, yeah we all go to the moon. Yeah, but, uh, you know, you need a rocket and uh, yeah, yeah, at some point they fly. But, uh, you know, the, we, we all move towards, let's say at the horizon, I see the moon, I, 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 I race towards it. And so uh, when you look now at the uh, different uh, kind of, uh, you know, participants in that race, some look like further ahead, some look less further ahead and so forth, you know. And, and if you just take now a look, then you say, ah, this one is, uh, might be the winner. But it's not like that. And uh, in this sense, your question is very good. It's very difficult to say now which uh, approach will win in the end first. And second, it might actually be so diverse that all of the approaches will contribute. You know, for example, you could say, well, the ions, they are now ahead or the superconducting qubits, uh, IBM already sells, they are ahead to some extent. Maybe we can use then that machine to uh, uh, optimize other approaches which have even a higher potential. So for example, Uh, in this beauty contest, you always look then at the uh, different features, maybe, you know, t between 20 and 100 different features. What do they have? Is it good? You know, are they fast? Are they big? Are they small? Uh, do they have long coherence times, uh, relaxation times? Uh, how can I manipulate them? How long does it take to measure them? Uh, what is the, you know, the total size of the system? How do I scale? And uh, each system tries to answer this in a different way. And then you compare Uh, you know, these different ways and which one would have potential here and potential there. And then when you look at it, you could say, well, you know, I make all these ticks and some of them, they look kind of good and one tick is missing. And this tick is a killer. And so uh, it might be, uh, you know, I, I could say, let's say superconducting qubits, uh, they have now 100, this is great, they have 400 in a year, it's fantastic. Uh, in the end, we need... Uh, I would say, uh, you know, between 100 million and a billion. Have you a favorite in this beauty contest or in this race? Oh, yeah, sure. On which horse would you bet? Well, uh, mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, I, I uh, kind of uh, invented, I proposed a uh, spin qubits in semiconductors uh, 20, 25 years ago with my colleague, uh, David DiVincenzo. And uh, this is a proposal which has uh, triggered tremendous uh, activities. So all the big semiconductor uh, uh, companies are working on that. I mean... Intel, uh, HRL, I mean, in, in Taiwan, you name it. And uh, many research labs worldwide uh, work on that. Now, if you look at what they have achieved so far, uh, inside, you know, when we look in details, what has been achieved from the last 20 years to now, it's fantastic. When you look from the outside and say, how many qubits? Oh, five, six. <laughs> Then it's not so great. But... Uh, If you look, if you compare then, let's say, with superconducting qubits, they have already, as I said, 100 or 200, right? IBM announced thousands. Yeah, they, well, they promise. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> It's fine. But uh, still, you know, we know from uh, past experience that you can hit a wall. 
So now I, I compare, you know, I do a beauty contest, which is not so serious, but I can compare. For example, the size of a uh, superconducting qubit is about a thousand or 10,000 times bigger than of a semiconductor qubit. Now, if you take a billion of those pieces, you know, you cover a it soccer field. <laughs> no, it's actually bigger. It's a soccer, yeah, yeah, okay, it's a soccer field, size of a soccer field, which you have to cool down, you know, to very, very low temperatures. And, and then you can say, well, is it possible? It's not totally unimaginable that it's possible that uh, NSA in the United States will finance that because one machine and no one else has it would be, would be a killer, <laughs> it would be fantastic, but they might be willing to do that. But if you think now, uh, can we actually, uh, you know, leverage what we have with semiconductor industry? So a chip uh, in your device, in your camera, in your uh, computer or in our iPhone with a square centimeter area has about now these days 200 billion transistors. This is a number which is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's uh, especially impressive if you go 60 years back where a transistor had this size, yep. one, right? And this industry has managed and the physics uh, around it has managed to shrink this to an incredible size. I mean, this is fantastic, this integration. And a spin qubit in semiconductor uh, 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 proposal has about that size of a transistor. So it's obvious and clear on which horse you bet. So for me, you know, I would say uh, it's not, uh, you know, if you ask me now timeline for the next uh, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, I would have different bets. Okay. So I would say, well, I bet now for the, you know, 10 years, so it was very interesting, Daniel Losa, thank you very much uh, for this interesting talk. Okay, yeah.